AI exposure right now is so important because we're going to get to a point that if you don't know what's going on with AI, you just can't do things anymore. It's going to be like a gate kept secret. Not the AI, the things that you could do. Ross, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, no problem. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to dive into this conversation with you. I use uh, AI Tutor and uh, I met you a few months ago now and it's been really cool getting to know you. You've been really accessible with uh, the tools uh, helping me learn a bit. For people that aren't familiar with you, why don't you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about what you're doing and then we'll dive into it deeper. Um, Sure. I don't want to spend too much time because I know we have lots of cool questions, but... Primarily, uh, my name is Ross, and I'm the founder of Tech in Schools Initiative. And we produce hundreds of applications um, throughout the years. But in the latest two years, we have built a new kind of tool for students, one that uses all the AI software currently in, in the world, but wrapped in a much easier way for them to use. But something happened already. I used it with a bunch of students, and they loved it. And then... After they tried it, I, I did like a um, kind of a beta test with some people in the, the real Twitter world and social media world, Facebook. And the feedback was so beyond insane that they asked before I took it away, can they pay for it? And that was something that I didn't have yet, actually, at that moment. So hmm. we once we turned it on for people to actually safely use the software... It was crazy because 14 years of building, right? And then like you build something like this and it takes off like absolute wildfire. And it's crazy because I, I see it. I understand like AI Tutor offers, you know, every single language model out right now, which normally you have to have a price tag on monthly for every single model. And though for the regular world, that's, you know, also kind of crazy. But for students, it's not just crazy. It's impossible. And schools, they, they, they actually can't do that. Monthly is not a thing they could do. So we were like passed with a really hard problem. But of course, it's not just like build it and run it. We actually had to make some serious partnerships to make this thing come to reality. Because we wanted to make sure that if we're going to build something like this already, it can't be like $700 a month. Like There has to be a way to make it affordable for the everyday person so that they're able to play with these tools without limits because learning doesn't have limits. And though we're not in school, you know, we're adults, but we're at kind of learning at this point right now. We're all kind of going back to school and relearning how to do things we already know how to do, but with AI. And so because of this, because of this exploration environment that we find ourselves in, being contained in a a walled environment with limitations doesn't allow the creative expression and learning to take place naturally. And we found it really limiting to not have it all in one place. So then I looked on the market already and I was like, wait a second, nothing, nothing is available. Yeah. And so then that's how this thing, you know, can't happen. And then I got to meet like so many cool people like yourself who are using what the tools we created for like things we did not build them for or intend. And that's the beauty of building software, I think. Yeah, it was kind of funny how we met. We You were in a space with uh, Cordell on, on X and you you mentioned AI Tutor a few times. You were talking, it was a prompting class and you were teaching and it was a really good class. But you were teaching how to build personalities essentially. And you mentioned it and I was like, Oh, I had uh, ChatGPT at the time only. And I was like, I, I don't have this these features that you're talking about. We, I think, met the next day and I ended up buying the product right away. It's been amazing being able to use all these LLMs in one interface without jumping from screen to screen. So you've been, it, it, Tech in Schools Initiative, is that 15 years old? I know you said you've been doing no, this about... Tech in Schools is about eight years old. Um, okay. Prior to Tech in Schools, I was building software for people. So they would come to me with their great idea, and then I would help them, you know, make it come alive. And then that would be that. And they would, you know, 
prosper and do whatever they do or fail, whatever it is. Like, but I wasn't a part of it. And it's great, you know, doing that for, I did that for like six years or something, five years. And then I figured out that like, if you could be 20 years old, right, Artie, and you can make like $25,000 in one shot, in one project, how is this not taught? Yeah. That was my question. Like, how, I, my brain could not understand how this was not taught, how they're not telling people that this is actually real and you don't need to be like something special. Like, for example, uh, you're not going to wake up and be like a pop star and know how to sing and be able to write amazing music because yeah. singing, even with auto tune, it does take talent, right? I think the talent in development comes with the repetition. I think it's buildable talent. You're not born with it. Like you don't wake up one day and you're just like, I am in the matrix. I see code. Like that's not real reality. Yeah. And I think that, um, when you do things in this way where you're able to craft something from nothing, it's almost equivalent to putting up a business like on, you know, 42nd street in times square which would cost you like fifty to hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah. But with the internet, you can just like put up your empire, and like no one's really going to charge you because the streets are equal. The only thing that's not equal is like advertising, which yeah. would be like, but that's that's expected. But at least you, anyone without any customers and any actual sale, could actually put something up and start having it marinate in the web. Like I. I know it seems like we're advertising a lot, but already I swear we don't even advertise at all. Like the thing we do the most is Twitter and hanging out with you guys on spaces. And after that, it's like back to building. Like we are thinking about running ads now about tech and schools, not even like AI tutor. Like I'm less concerned about AI tutor, more concerned about how tech and schools can utilize AI tutor because tech and schools has the ability to give AI tutor to students for yeah. free which is what we want to do. And that's like the whole entire mission is like, that's what we're trying to do. It's like if people think when they meet us, we're some AI company and it's like, you couldn't even be more wrong. Yeah. AI is like an afterthought of what we're doing. It's like a means to an end. Like it helps us get from point A to point B quicker. And if I said like, there's companies right now building around AI as like their company, but if you look into the history of like TSI and you read about us, like there's like the digital ocean thing happened well before AI even existed. Mm -hmm. And so it just sort of allowed us to do more in a different way and allow people like well, students to learn in an accelerated fashion and allow teachers to stop spending, you know, five hours making lesson plans. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much time actual teachers spend uh, in public school after hours. And we haven't published this yet. And I'm, I'm going to already eventually soon, but we have like actual proof of how AI can augment you as a teacher. Like not forget the student for a minute, like the teacher, yeah. it can change how teachers teach. Like I, I got off a call. We ha I have my onboarding calls, you know, already you had one, but yeah, you know, they're all so different and I don't like any one more than the other, but I think the interesting ones for me are like people that are trying to do things differently, right? So learning a new skill, sort of like when we had your onboarding and like a lot of people that try and do coding for the first time with our tools and that's great. Then there's those ones that like just leave me word wordless, like without words, where they're like, I don't have time to spend with my kids anymore. And you just gave that back to me. You have no idea what you've just done. Like, it's like, I hope you understand the weight. And then I'll just take a moment and process that. And it's, it's so interesting to have that sort of reaction for an AI product, you know? Yeah. And I think that is the core reason why we build. And I mean, I speak for all of us, but definitely me. But I definitely speak for all of us for sure. This is why we build as a team. And you can't do this kind of stuff. You can't make this kind of impact without a team that is working round the clock. Like if something goes down, we're here. If it's one in the morning, we're here. It doesn't matter. 
And outside of that, that's just the, you know, asset or the physical software part of like what we do. But then there's like the entire educational aspect. And though, you know, this is not public school, you get that. But even you, when you first saw what we were doing, like, and we're just getting started. Like I brought no partners on the first one. Imagine now when it's star studded and all the partners are involved in our Twitter space, which is crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Like, you can take these people that are like companies that really don't put out Twitter or tweets or posts like that involving anyone. Right. And then this, these, you're seeing companies like I'm in talks with two companies right now in the middle of a huge blog post. Um, and I won't ruin it because this is recorded, but there are two really cool companies that are helping power Pixio. And it's a story that hasn't been told yet. And it's so interesting to be able to work with these companies from when they were like just getting started. And now they're like the talk of the town on AI Twitter. And so it's super interesting to form these relationships to build these cool transformative products. Because if I didn't do it this way already, software would just be one, really, really expensive and tokenized. Imagine yeah. what a world. And I didn't want to do that. But I think doing things like what we're doing in spaces right now with ITT, the Integrated Think Tank, and, you know, these Wednesday spaces, and now coming next with, like, building a WordPress site, that's, like, impact that I normally was addressing on a local level. Now, imagine you address the thing that worked already for seven years and then do it on a global scale. That's that's what I want to do. Like, the idea... Behind all of this is, can you like recreate the internet safely? And unfortunately for me, part of the internet is AI. So I have to recreate that safely too, or guess what? Kids can't use it. That's the reality. And so me working so hard on these tools and making them just totally different than what you would get or expect from like, you know, these run of the mill chat UIs like Gemini and all these other companies, they're just throwing together a UI where we're carefully thinking about what could you do different. And for us, eliminating the token count was like just the first step. But I think being able to put models in like the day they come out, I think is a testament to the way that we build modularly. So it's like something can come out and I don't have to like, like the, the sky doesn't have to fall. I can just go and make like a quick little change and it will just work because we decided we're going to stop. And this is a coding funny problem is like we were defining all the models. Like, but then we were like, wait a second, these models are coming out faster than like, I don't even know, whatever the fastest thing is. Like, it's crazy. I would go to sleep. Four would be up in the morning. I would go to sleep. There'd be another five. And we're talking about mainstream, not mainstream. It's hundreds. So we had to figure out like, how do we restructure this whole thing? That was like a, uh, about 12 hour coding experience for me. And AI tutor is refactoring the entire AI tutor code to be modular, which was crazy, but I don't even know how I would have done it without AI tutor. That seemed like it was like changing 40,000 lines of code. Like it was wild. And I felt like I had my own little developer team just like right here. And that is the craziest part, because I firmly believe in, do you know what dog fooding is? Dog coding? Dog fooding. No, no, I don't. So let's say, Artie, you're like, oh, I think that the way to get the best podcast is to do three push-ups and then drink a cup of warm coffee, right? Let's just say. Now, if you don't do that, if you don't have your three push-ups and drink your coffee before your podcast, you're like not practicing what you preach, right? You're like, selling this thing, you're saying this is great, but then you're not doing it. So that so that would be dog fooding. So if gotcha. I'm out here selling AI Tutor, right? And selling Pixio, but then I'm over here paying like Gemini or Claude on their platform, and I prefer that, then I probably shouldn't make anything. And I should probably just gotcha. delete it. But because I use my software every day, like I dog food it every day. I don't even do it because it's what you're supposed to. I do it because it's the best tool out there. Yeah. Like I... And that's the crazy thing is if you're not dog fooding your own software, then what's the point? If you're not going to use it, that's bad. Don't build something you're not going to use. 
Yeah. And so the fact that our team uses AI Tutor all day, every day, it makes me confident and comfortable telling people, hey, you should buy this. It's really good. And it's not just because I, I created it, because like I yeah. use it every day. And if it wasn't for AI Tutor, Pixio would not exist. That's real. And that's just crazy. Why don't you explain a little bit about what these two applications are? So we have Pixio for uh, visual content creation and editing, and then you have uh, AI Tutor, which is connected to a bunch of LLMs, but it's bigger than that. So why don't you dive into a little bit about what those two applications do? It's getting harder to do this as we add more, obviously. But (laughs) AI Tutor is basically your unlimited access playground to every model that exists, but broken down into various different apps. So instead of just a chat UI, there's many things that you could do, including creating your own bot that could live outside of our AI Tutor ecosystem and live on your website and also be, you know, you fully control it and you declare which language model is used in this process. And in addition to having all the language models, we even now are starting to pit them against each other. So with, with Beam, for example, they all work together and it's like eight of the smartest people helping you on your problem all the time. And it is crazy and intense, but honestly, what's the point of not exploring all the other voices in the room? I mean, they're there and they're super smart and super powerful. And it's like, I think there's so much value in being like, hey, write me a blog post on the latest and greatest in marketing in 2024. And then GPT is like, well, here's some stuff. But again, I'm not on the internet. So as long as you know that. And then I'm like, well, hold on. And then I switched to perplexity. I'm like, hey, can you bring me some information about what was just said in the above paragraph, which was GPT? Then it's like, here's some references from the internet about what GPT said. And you can switch back to GPT and be like, hey, put both these together. And then it puts it together in a nice analytical way. And then you're like, wait, guys, plug, turn this into human. And then I'm posting it on WordPress. And that, I think, is crazy and awesome and this is how we should be using them. It shouldn't be one size fits all. That's not how this is going to work in the future. It's going to be um, language models that you want. And so different models will have different things. So if you're learning coding, you would use a code model that's very good. And if you're doing teaching, you would use whatever teaching model exists. Now, I'm saying these words like teaching model, code, these don't exist. I'm talking about the future. The future is going to yeah. be specialized LLMs that are domain specific and yes gpt is awesome but when you think about it things like developer right and like there's certain buttons developer and edu pal that when you click you actually trigger a fine tune um harvey ai is another example of a company that took gpt fine-tuned it and made it incredibly specific in a domain now i could take open ai and chat gpt and give it a, my, a prompt for developer and then i can give it to developer and I need the same prompt, but developer is going to probably nail it, or a chat GPT will take like two, three times because the difference is domain, spe- domain specific models. They make a big, big, big difference. A lot of people don't understand or don't realize that there's a lot more like to the realm of an LLM. There's like the fine tune, there's the version, there's the system prompt. There's the agentic flow, whatever it is that you create. So like for me, for EDU pal and plus there is a flow that keeps a constant and the constant is who you are, your age, what kind of learning style you have. And if you like examples, like literal, or if you like metaphorical, this is kept in a constant, a constant, like an agentic state. I know it sounds like a crazy word, but all agentic means is something managed by an agent. That's it. It's nothing crazy. It just sounds crazier than it is. But that's going to be the future is when people say agents, that, that's what they mean. They mean things that manage and hold state and memory and can remember what time it is tomorrow. What's the last message you had three days ago? It could tell you the time. Like that's yeah. sort of new things that's going to be coming. But right now, I mean, on Hugging Face alone, there's 400,000 models that are just yeah. LLMs. So 
it's getting quickly to a point where there needs to be not like a leader because they're all leaders, right? Like OpenAI, Gemini, Google, like all these are leaders, but somebody needs to create like, I don't know, like I don't even know what the name would be, but like something to like put it all in one place for once and for all. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't know what it would be, but it would be like if they all work together, right? Let's just say, yeah. and they don't have to build anything, but they just have to like keep this going list of like what they're building. So like, I don't want to know about tokens about Gemini 1.5 Flash. Like you telling me it has 1 million tokens is the same as you telling me Gemini 1.5 Pro has the same token. Oh, Gemini Flash is faster. Okay. But like, really, what's the difference? Yeah. And I think that'd be cool if they did that. The token terminology confuses people. Oh, but man. I tell people, and this is not perfect. It doesn't line up perfectly, but it's a token is essentially a word. It could be more than a word. It could be it's less like than a word. word. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, that's how I see it. It's like in the code, it's like a chunk of words. Like if the sentence is "Hi, my name is Artie," "Hi M" could possibly be a token, and then yeah. "Y name" could be another one. Yeah, it's gonna break up the word "my" in a weird way. That's yeah. like, uh, it's weird. It makes no sense, but yeah. this is what it is. Yeah, um, it's kind of funny when I listened to your interview with Rob Scoble, uh you mentioned in schools in the past and for a long time, the only thing that's really been taught is keyboard, uh, how to type. And yeah. I had to laugh because that's all I learned in school as far as computers were, were yeah. concerned. I played Oregon Trail a little bit and some bowling game. That's about all I remember. And I honestly didn't even learn how to type in those classes. I cheated every time. I, I just we put a piece of paper on our hands and I would just look under. Oh I didn't God. learn how to type until I was in my twenties. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you don't need to, you don't need to actually type to be able to use a computer because you can see what you're typing. Although it's useful. You know, what's funny already about this. Like I have these two interesting memories. One was from a month ago and somebody signed, uh, somebody signed up for AI tutor that could not see. Yeah. That means they can't type in theory. And so according to when I was in high school and learning, you know, computers in high school and middle school, they would say, well, you need to do this. You won't be able to use a computer. Fast forward 2024, this, this, uh, guy bought our software and he used screen reader and doesn't type. So I think what you learn is from the, its ability to be useful is from the optics of the person teaching it, not necessarily its usefulness. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I did the same thing. I uh, learned how to type. It's kind of, I don't know. I think school could have used these classes to do a lot, like with um, the beginning of MySpace and what that was, social media, and just internet, not just typing. Yeah. But they, like, dropped the ball completely to the point that people still aren't typing right now in 2024. Yeah, yeah and you mentioned schools miss the boat with teaching people about social media. And I completely agree with that. Social media really got started right around when I was graduating high school and around 2003. And I, I guess it started before that, but nobody knew what the hell they were dealing with. No, like, especially when you're a kid, when you're, or a young adult, you don't really understand that when you're putting something on social yeah. media, it's going to be there forever. You're putting on something that could destroy your life potentially if it's it's if it's damaging, and yeah, we're just not taught that. Well, they skipped it because they didn't think it was important, or maybe it was a fad. My yeah. favorite three letter word in education. You yeah. know, they thought the internet was a fad already. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. it was just going to be a going to go away. It's not going to really do anything. And look where we are. Yeah. And so I've been in the rooms, and, th and I'm not making it up, I swear. I've been in rooms where teachers are like, yeah, we uh, we dropped that ball. I'm like, yeah, you did. <laughs> but, yeah. like, we don't learn about this. And, and I think exposure is important. So, like, tomorrow we have an event in New York um, with the Department of Education. But we're going to go, and we're going to have a big um, projector, right, Artie? We're going to throw up AI Tutor and TurboCraft and let people see 
what AI could do. And then we're all going to be wearing Apple Vision Pros. We're going to look like we just arrived from a different planet. It's going to be <laughs> insane. And, and all this is just to show people the power of technology because the Apple Vision Pro ain't going anywhere near a classroom unless it's with this logo. Yeah. Nobody will do it. Nobody will actually do it. And I will do it. I don't care. I'm not scared. I'm not scared of it breaking. I'm not scared of like people being like, oh my God, VR. I don't yeah. care. Because exposure is more important than however I may feel about something. Yeah. Whether they use it or not, whether they become engineers, exposure is really important. Like AI exposure right now is so important because we're going to get to a point that if you don't know what's going on with AI, you just can't do things anymore. It's going to be like a gate kept secret. Yeah. Not the AI, the things that you could do. Like people don't understand what this is going to do. And only people that are building AI can tell you there is some monumental stuff about to go down. It's pretty crazy. And the fact that I can put clothes on people in Pixio coming soon, that's not out yet, but it's coming soon, maybe next week, um, is crazy already. Like imagine you have your, my, my TSI logo and I want to put it on the model. I could do that. Yeah. He or she will wear it. And I think there's companies now that, um, we will, Actually, Artie, do you do a space after after this? Um, I do a space uh, every Thursday. Okay, wh- when's your next one? Next Thursday? Um, yeah, it'll be next week. That's cool. On the 23rd. So maybe I'll come to your space and, and I'll, I'll have some invite keys for this thing for people that come. Awesome. Um, so um, we're partnering with this company, new company, that's very new on the AI market, but they have something I've never ever seen before. So when it can stop me in my tracks, we're going to have a conversation. And this one, I mean, I've never seen anything in the world like it. It is so crazy how it makes avatars that are actual people to the point that you can like upload yourself. Oh, wow. And it's so crazy. And they've decided to give us keys, but I think they gave, they gave us a lot. So we might have some extra from Wednesday. I'll bring some to your space. And if anyone wants them, they could try it out. It's awesome. like, 2000 tokens to make video, but not like video, like regular video, like podcast looking video of like a person talking. It's nuts. Well, the space that we'll do together is on the 30th. So, um, because that's when this will release. And I'm looking forward to that. I think it'd be awesome. Well, on our space, I'll have something cool that we're building. That's not okay. Cool. Cool. But this, I want to have to get rid of all the keys by a certain date. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. It's funny when you mention people calling the internet a fad because, I mean, my entire adult life when I was, you know, lived in different apartments every couple of years, every time I moved into an apartment, three things, you got to get electricity, gas, internet. That's all that mattered when I got into a place. And that's been the case my entire life. I, I live on the internet, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it got to a point now already. You can't make a business on a website and the bank, the bank will ask you for a URL now. That's yeah. it. They did not always do that. When I made my first organization, they did not ask for that anyway at all. Yeah. So people listening might, they may be into AI, they may not be. And a lot of people that are just getting into it a little bit, most people are familiar with chat GPT. Uh, and they they think everything is chat GPT and they think that's all AI is. But you're talking about all these different LLMs and somebody listening might say, well, why why should I care about all of these different ones? So maybe we can di- dive into some of the bigger ones and you can give a little details on why you like different LLMs for different things. Yeah, I mean, I will say... Okay, so like I can go into that, but I, I, I think what people need to realize is what a, a good metaphor that I use in classes and even in my uh, one-on-one courses that we have with individuals that are like boot camp college style. I, um, I explain to them it's like cars. And if you have a car, like if you own a car, at some point you have to release a car and pick out the car you want and the color and what it could do. Now, there's a lot of cars and some are better than others, but we can't exactly switch cars because that costs a lot of money, but you can fully decide 
that you don't want to take your car to the airport. You want to rent to Uber because it's easier. There's no parking. And so cars are like, there's a bunch of them. Think of cars like LLMs. They both are going to get you to, from point A to point B, but they're going to do it differently. Some will do it safer. Some will do it less safe. Some will be like electric cars and be crazy and do new things like Grok with a Q super fast. <laughs> and some will, will not be. Some will be older. And it'll be always a competition. So you'll have like Audi, Mitsubishi, BMW, you know, OpenAI, Gemini, Mistral. Yeah. And it's like you can use them all. They're all going to get you there, but they're going to do it different. Like one may take the side roads, one may take the highway. And I think understanding the cars is important because that's how you pick a car. You don't just say, Give me that nice green one. Like you have no idea what it is. You're going to research it. Why is it good? How long? What's the mileage? Mileage or token counts. Um, what's, what's the mileage? What's the safety ratings? How much is it? What does it cost? Like you, you learn. So people should learn about LLMs the way they do their car before they buy it, before they get in the wheel and hit turbo mode, you know? Yeah. But we're in a place right now where people are just understanding what ChatGPT is. And then they have to zoom out and understand that ChatGPT is just an interface to a model called GPT, which then if you zoom out more, it's like, oh, there's GPT, there's Gemini, there's Perplexity, there's Claude. And it's like, they're all different, but they all get you from point A to point B. Like they will all make you a lesson plan, but who's going to make it better? Yeah. And that's important because... When you're doing real stuff and you're not saying, write me a story or make some jokes, pretend to be Jerry Seinfeld. When you're producing news articles for your organization like I am, it filters like I explained to you. Like, so in my latest blog, I started with GPT and then it felt it was a little, not like luster, a little stale or what I like to say, dead behind the eyes. So when there's that, I'm like, okay, we need to add some more information. So I said, reach out to the internet, search mytsi.org. Give me some latest stuff from our blog that we can include in this blog. And then I had Claude summarize it. Hmm. So it's about almost as if it's like gears too. So it's like, there's like a sub level of this metaphor where like, if you're in the multimodal car, let's say, like AI Tutor, the skill is not picking the car. It's changing gears in the middle of your driving. Yeah. And so there's learning, like actual learning that, like there's no book right now. Like if I go to Amazon and like the LLM dictionary doesn't exist because the info is too coming out too quick. Like it's too fast. People can't even, I have onboardings with people who are like, okay, what is GDP? And I'm like, okay. We got this a little bit wrong. GDP is like money for, for, for like countries. GPT is the AI. And it's like, that is where I'm at when I have an onboarding with some people. And it doesn't mean they're bad or they're not smart. It means that they're just, just getting started. And I just became the first door they opened, which is great. But there's a lot of knowledge and I see the where I see the issue that you're talking about. It is a big issue. I don't know how to solve it on a big scale because there's people that actually don't know what's going on and they just think they just have to go pay all these things. With some of the models out right now, what are some of the the tasks that certain models are particularly good at that you've noticed? Um, okay. So GPT-4 is my favorite. I call it the smartest person in the room, uh, for turbo GPT-4 turbo 0125. No, 0412, the latest one. Then there's GPT-4.0, which I don't trust. I don't trust any new model until I do stuff with it. Um, but I really like GPT-4 turbo. It's been my go-to for all coding. Um, then when I have it write things, it kind of gets a little crazy. It kind of attempts to like make a blog like a scientist and very like, I'm just like, chill, relax, breathe. Yeah. And so I would have to switch it to like Claude Sonnet, which for me gives really, really good light, light writing, but informative. Yeah. And then I would use GPT to now correct Sonnet in any, you know, 
issues it might have got wrong or but while maintaining the voice of Sana and Claude. So I like Claude for writing social media a lot. Hmm. Claude's really, really good at that. Gemini 1.5 is, honestly, I don't have like uh, what it's good at. I can just tell you, like, if I have a code base that's like 500,000 lines of code and I need a million, I go there because nothing else could do it. No. So if it's like, if I wanted to write a book, I need Gemini. There's nothing else that could do it. I mean, normally that won't take you 17 years to sit there, 200,000 pr- uh, tokens every, every prompt. Whereas like, you get a million a prompt. That's like a whole book in one prompt. It could read a whole entire book. Yeah. And then there's perplexity, which is like, honestly, really stupid. Like, honestly, the stupidest person in the room, but it has the internet. So I use it to do like raw talking to the internet. So you can just be like, Give me information using your superpower search tools on the internet about this. And then I will say, like, expand on this with GPT. Because perplexity is not the greatest when it comes to, like, analytical discussion. For me. I mean, I only could speak for me. But if I had to recommend, I would tell people fact check with perplexity. It's really, really good at this. Yeah. What's uh, Mistral good for? It's kind of, like, overall, like... Um, good at everything, master at none type situation. It tends to be less biased than all of them, which is nice, but also not as analytical. And okay. it does not support function calling just yet. And then, and then, uh... well, I mean, it does, but not in our software. So we'd have to do like a specific new kind of function calling for Mistral, which we're, we're just going to wait until it's all compatible. Gotcha. Llama is built on GPT. Oh, yeah, I forgot that one. That's like my current favorite, by the way, Llama 3. Okay. Yeah, that's like my favorite when it comes to like trying new stuff on. It's new, so I like to put it through the ringer. It's yeah. been really good at nearly everything. Uh, the only part it kind of was not good at would be some um, hard, like very hard coding problems. But when it came mm-hmm. to like writing and content, it's superior. Like yeah. that model is one of my. I use it every day for content. Okay. I just go to GPT when the content's about something super important, like the difference between Drizzle ORM and Prisma. You know, like that's a really tough thing. And those are both two ways to deal with databases in code. Yeah. It's, uh, It's kind of funny how people... AI can seem divisive because people are afraid of it. People think, you know, we're going to end up in that Terminator world or uh, yeah. iRobot kind of stuff. But sure. a lot of people that are afraid of it don't realize that most people have been using AI for years without really knowing it, you know? Uh, yeah, this is true too. I think fear is is like half Terminator and half job oh. loss. And half what? Job loss. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the job loss part is interesting because I think there's other avenues that are going to open up for people that we probably aren't even anticipating yet because the technology is not just going to run on its own and and be over everything. You know know these posts on Twitter that just make me laugh? It's so funny. Developers are dead. Programmers are are never going to be a thing. You don't need to learn how to program. I mean, even if the AI does all your programming, which it does for me, do you know how much human development has to go into like standing up servers and stuff and making sure things work? And like when people DDoS, how to like stop them, like people just have it all wrong. And I tell everyone the same thing, like teachers, students, your job isn't going to get taken at all. It will maybe disappear. And a new version will exist, but it's the people you're competing with, not AI. The people are going to become really good at AI. And those people are going to win every single time. Like, there won't even be a competition. You can have the best resume. If there's someone that can produce more with AI, they get the job. Yeah. That, I think, is something people really need to consider. Is if they're not... Like, you don't have to be on the AI bandwagon. You don't have to be, like, an AI stand on Twitter, but you do have to understand how like you could write 25 emails today, or you can write 300. Yeah. And 
the 300 emails is the one that's going to keep their job. Yeah. And that's the, the thing people need to really focus on. And as far as the Terminator people, I mean, we are just n- number one, not even there yet at all or close. But if something happens, if that's what you're afraid of, well, it's the people that would build that. And the people that are currently doing what they're doing are not trying to build that. Like they're trying to make it do your dishes. Yeah, the the fear, well, I mean, you touch on something really important. AI is a tool. I mean, it's a technology, it is a tool. And it all comes down to how people are using it and how people are programming it. And it's, you mentioned AI stands and people that are just, everything AI is good and I don't see it that way. It, everything depends on the context. Like I, I had some friends share a, a post about AI being used in the military in uh, aerial combat simulations and stuff like that. And they shared it and I had some reservations about it because I'm like, I think AI is amazing in a lot of contexts, but when it comes to military it's not something that I'm really looking forward to like better weapons, you know, like that's actually a scary aspect and it all depends on the context. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a deep, long conversation that has to be had, but like the voice cloning, the deep fakes, like AI is, I wouldn't say it's a weapon because weapon indicates bad. I would say it's like a knife. Like you can yeah. make a salad and cut a tomato or you can do bad things with a knife. And yeah. so we're going to have this balance. What has to happen is I think the government needs to step in and be like, here's what you're allowed to do. Here's what you're not allowed to do. Don't break the rules. And until they do that, it's quite difficult because it truly is like the wild, wild west. And I'm just so fortunate to have really, really good partners in doing this because without them, I would be so scared to launch these kind of services. Like if I didn't have like the barrier of their firewalls and ability to stop misuse, like there's a lot of things that can go into such a good thing that could make it bad. Like people are kind of mad when they're on TurboCraft and it won't let you uh, generate certain things. And it'll let you generate a lot. Like, there's a lot you can get away with. And then there's things you absolutely can't. Mm -hmm. And then I remember, like, removing someone from our platform, and they just were, like, really mad. And I'm like, well, we reserved that right, fortunately. Yeah. We could be like, you're not generating anymore. Here's a full refund. Um, And it's important that companies set these standards and create these rules, even though we don't have to, but like you've probably heard me say in the past, like you don't, you don't need a law to do the right thing. Like you just don't like, you can just be like, Hey, I don't think this is a good idea. So we're just going to, as a company, not stand for this. We're allowed to do that. And I think if, there was laws we wouldn't have to take it into our own hands and figure out what's good and what's bad. But I know for us, when I get on an onboarding call and we do, we go over like magic, for example, I'm just like, what do you want it for? Like, what are you planning to do? And then I will periodically check in with them and see how they're using the voice cloning software. And if it's something I deem like unsavory, I'll just ban them. Yeah. It's really important that people aren't going to use voice cloning for the wrong reasons for me as where we stand, but for other companies are like, I don't care, do what you want. But for me, it's, it's not why we created this. Like that's not the reason. Yeah. I mean, the, the power of the tools increase the power of negative consequences if they're used that way. And, but you're right. You don't have to have a law saying, don't do this to know that it's wrong. Like a law doesn't, Laws don't dictate morality, you know? Like Yeah. But that's so, the, you say that, but they kind of does. Yeah. Because the law is what's gonna stop someone from even if they didn't have a good moral compass to being able to do the wrong thing. That's where yeah. the law comes in. But without the law, you are solely 
relying on someone's moral compass and not everyone follows it. Yeah. Yeah. We're, and that we have different morals. Yeah. But when you're, but see what you just said is important. We all have different morals, but does that matter when you're building for so many people? Like what matters already? My moral that I have as Ross, our morals as a team or the injected morals from the outside. Yeah, it'd be the injected. Exactly. So as a builder, are you going to take the injected ones or are you just going to take the ones you think? Yeah. And that's the problem when you build services. And like, that's why these companies, like even big, huge companies, they'll be like, hey, we're switching this up because this is not a good idea because you said you don't want us to train on your data. So we're not going to do it. But you now have to pay double if you want that to stop. Yeah. And it's, it's, these things are going to happen and form as we go. Like stable diffusion came out and all these things came out. Then the lawsuits happen later. Like the lawsuits don't happen first. So all that happens later. So that's why the morals truly do matter. If you don't want to be in a situation later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, because there's no rules. No one could say what anyone did at all of any kind, in any way, is wrong. They yeah. just can't. Yeah, and I mean, the the voice cloning is specifically, I mean, it's one really important thing, right? I mean, we're going to have, we're going to end up in a situation where people can fake videos of people too, which is just a very scary element to that. That's right now, the voice cloning. When I said earlier that it stopped me in my tracks, that company, you just said what they do. Hmm. And it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. That it's that fidelity where it looks like me and you. Yeah. Like it doesn't even look like we're at all. Yeah. For the, for the most part, right now, when I see deep fakes, I can usually tell they're fake, but I'm, I know it's around the corner where I'm not going to know. And that it's a little concerning. I'll get, I'll see maybe somebody will send me a video of like Joe Rogan, like saying something. I'm like, that's not really him talking like i can tell there's some like just things that aren't lining up but man in six months in a year it is going to be tough to tell like there's some stuff i've seen in these some companies like some different companies i know hey jim is one of them it's really good but then when i saw this company i was just like what like how and they're yeah. just like oh api coming soon You'll be on the first, um, you know, like uh, batch. And I'm like, how much is it going to be? They're like, well, don't worry about it. You won't have to pay. I'm like, what? Yeah. They're like, yeah, we're going to support you. I'm like, that's so cool. And then I'm like, would you want to come to ITT and like talk? Because I think it's so cool what you guys are doing and to show people what you what you have. You can just shill everyone and get and get customers. <laughs> it's so cool. Like, who would not want to be your customer? <laughs> and they're just like. Our team is super small. And I'm sure you know what that what that means because um, because we spoke. But I told them we're like small team too. They're like we're incredibly focused on building right now, but we actually are excited to do something like a space with you all. Nice. So nice. that's like, awesome. I think that would be so cool. But um, I could show you because I know this is going to air, but o- offline I could show you like what it is. You can see, but I want to make it to like when I say it the first time, it's the first time for real. Yeah. Um, but it's so cool that when I was like, oh, uh, I'm going to do a quick demo, they're like, better. They're like, we're giving you upload credits. I'm like, what now? They're like, you could turn into one of them. I'm like, one of them. I'm like, they're a them. It's so crazy. <laughs> and then, and they're like, but wait, we're going to give you 50 seats. Oh, wow. That's 50 things that you can create. No, 50 seats for other people like you. Oh, wow. Okay. Do it too. Yeah. And then everyone's going to get like 5,000 tokens, which is enough to create like 15 videos. Wow. And upload. Everyone will have upload credits. And I just think if companies keep going in this direction, like as soon as I saw their demo, like everyone will see different things. Like Artie will see, oh my God, a podcaster in AI. And then someone else would be like, oh, marketing, commercial. And then Ross is like, a teacher's aide, live. Yeah. Like a full body 
And you're like, hey, Miss AI, what do you think? <laughs> like, that's crazy. <laughs> I just, my brain just, it, it's funny when I think about these things, because then I'm like, wait a second. Is it actually that crazy or is it actually possible? And it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's possible, Artie. <laughs> we are at that point where I can build, like, they have a smart board. So I can have a full, you know, or like a face avatar, like just talking, streaming live. Yeah. Where it's not rendering, it's not generating, it's a web socket live. And that's something coming soon to, to Pixio, actually. So you'll be able to make uh, live streaming avatars in Pixio soon. We're be, we're be partnering with DID to pull this off. What's something that doesn't exist right now that you see in the future, but just isn't even possible with AI? in its current state. So like a type of AI or like a program or a use? Yeah, a use or program. So oh, I have a few. So first model, a model that would be nice would be text to diagram or text to mathematical explanation or text to um, equation. I think it'd be really cool. So, yeah. like, if you were able to be, like, I don't know, parabolas and what they are, and you hit enter, it could create, like, a 15-second video with audio and, like, explaining the parabola for, like, a math class. Yeah. I think there's a huge value in these modal, like, multimodal connectors. So, we have something coming called a video to voiceover, and all you do is upload a video, and you get a voiceover. So, it watches the video and plugs in the words where it needs to. Interesting. Without words existing. So it'll right. just make up, it'll, it'll make up the dialogue. The that should be and there. make up the dialogue as it goes. Yeah. Interesting. So things like that, I think really excite me where they're taking steps. And by steps, I mean, upload this. Here's my audio. Here's my video. Go. And then it like figures out the script, puts it in the video, re-edits the video, exports the new video, and you just download it. You don't actually edit the video at all. And that doesn't exist yet. And I'm building that. It's the first ever video to voiceover model. It's, it's like video input, voiceover video output. So no prompt, just video in, video out. Yeah. And I think to go even further would be like the text to diagram or text to equation, I think would be really cool because we have the power to make video already, five seconds, whatever. But we need to pair that with the ability to understand like an equation in math to explain a quick concept in 30 seconds to a student. So it'd be like text to concept would be like the model. Yeah. So it, you could say like lava and then it would explain the concept of lava with visuals, a little volcano, some arrows going up and lava arrows going down, showing, you know, similar to what we get with diagrams, like in an educational setting now. Yeah, that would be incredible. Um, when it comes to coding, let's say, uh, you clearly don't think coding is going away, and I agree with you there. Is the traditional path to learning coding going away? Oh, yeah, it's being flipped right on, right upside down. Like It's yeah. going to be hit like a freight train. The way people code is going to be different. I have the um, amazing opportunity that I'm so thankful for to work with people not just, you know, with AI Tutor and Pixio, but actual colleges, professors, and things like that. And I've been able to help transition, you know, a college professor that learned coding the regular way to learning Python, a language he didn't know, a whole different way. And the thing is, even with the old knowledge, even with the prior knowledge and the past knowledge and the generational knowledge of coding, this way is still better in all ways. So any engineer would never be like, oh, coding is going away. See, here's the fun part. You know who says coding is going away? Hmm. Non-coders. Non-coders. Love yeah. that. Don't you love that? I think that's so funny. So yeah. The people that think we're going to disappear, right, are people that don't know, don't know how to code. Yeah. They're the ones that are perpetuating this nonsense. Because even if it writes all of my code, what it can't do is infrastructure. And it can't make sure everything is safe. And it can't check things. Like, we have AI malware checkers and they just miss things 
and I check it once a month and I find things and I'm like, oh, see, it was too sneaky. It still didn't find it. It, it looked no. too like WordPress for it to detect that one. But I know because I know when I see a base64 encoded hashed URL, that is not good no. in a WordPress site. And I think coding will be different, but not just coding. I think, well, okay. So there's parts of coding. There's like at the top, it's like server, server administration, DevOps, cybersecurity, right? And then it's like database. So your database functions and your management. So cPanel, MySQL, PHP, MyAdmin, that type of thing. HostGator, like the front end. Then under that, a website layer. Then the infrastructure in the back end. Then under that, what the user sees. So there's a lot from like what the user sees all the way up to that stack of like what creates it to work. And yeah, AI is going to play a really big role in the coding part, but not the other parts. That's different. There's not going to be an AI that's going to go talk to Superbase, correct your problems, and then go send that information to Vercel automatically. No, there's an AI in Superbase that'll help you write SQL commands. Then you can write your commands and then take that and then manually go to Vercel and hit redeploy. Like it's a workflow altering thing, not a job, a job like going away thing. Yeah. Because even if the AI is really good, Who's going to make sure it stays healthy? Yeah. That's the developer. And like, even if AI is crazy, I mean, and great and amazing, there's still going to be people who don't even know what AI is and then want to build AI applications. So let's say websites are a thing in the past and like, you'll never build a website again because AI is here. Well, who's going to build the cool AI programs? Certainly not the AI. Like it doesn't even know what it is, let alone yeah. building with itself. Like, who's going to think of the next Devin? Is the AI, is ChatGPT going to be like, hey, let's make Devin? No. Like, people are going to come up with awesome solutions. And I think the people aren't going anywhere the way they do things are. So a new developer does not need four years of learning Python and HTML and JavaScript. They could just literally sit down with AI Tutor and be like, I want to build this. What languages we got to learn? You know, like, you don't have to know anything. That that's what's changing. Yeah, I've, I have, I mean, we've talked about this. I have some software ideas. Um, I know a little bit of code, but not a ton. Yeah, but you're a testament. You built Python. That's the hardest one. Yeah, and you, you I, built Python custom. That's crazy. Yeah, and no, well, I've, I've just written a paragraph to explain exactly what I want for several different uh, SaaS ideas, and it'll just. It'll walk you through it. Like, okay, well, here's what we still need to figure out from what you want to do. And then just walks you through it and you're learning as you go, but you're not just learning. You're, you're like creating what you want instead of doing the old way of like, okay, let's create hello world. And now let's create another program that you never use and have no applications for. Like you're just diving into the program that you actually want to create. And it's, it's, amazing it's quite amazing yeah you know it's even crazier already when you start to treat it like an actual developer which is what i've been doing lately and before i give it a brief i will ask it about the project i'll have it construct um a technology like uh, a technology-based document with the stack so like almost like a proposal and then i would give it the proposal like mm. a, it's like a, a tech document like what you would do to a real developer you'd give them a document laying out the tech stack to use, what languages. And first I work with AI Tutor to build that. And then I give that to AI Tutor in a new chat and be like, hey, this is what we're doing. Here's your brief. Yeah. Which is interesting because then it constrains it to a style of language and platform and tech stack. So yeah. it doesn't deviate. You mentioned Devin. Are, is there a plan to hopefully integrate Devin into AI Tutor eventually? Uh, yeah, so there's like three open source projects that we're kind of just going to put together. Um, and we're going to release something for sure that's going to be using GPTO. And it's going to okay. it's going to have its own Vim and command line. We're just figuring out storage, like what to do with the storage. We haven't figured out if we want to charge people for the storage because that's going to be expensive or 
just give your super base key. Yeah. Like go to super base, get your super base key and put it in our app and then it will use your own database. That's yeah. something I'm thinking about. Cause I don't want to make something that costs a lot of money to run. I want to make something that's affordable, really affordable. If not something I could just throw in premium and it's part of the subscription. That's yeah. of course the goal. Yeah, storage is something that a lot of people might overlook when it comes to well, new technologies. It's funny, Artie, because like you would think, like a picture, oh, you're fine, it's a picture. Yeah, try 400,000 pictures, like yeah. our Pixio. Like I had to clean out the Pixio folders yesterday for because the, it's like a cache folder, which basically keeps not your image, like I can't look at your image, but it's like a storage of that image, but I can't click it because it's encrypted. Yeah. It was like... Almost a whole terabyte already of images, yeah. 400,000 images, almost a terabyte. Is that crazy? Yeah. And that's so easy to forget when you have like something generating thousands of images a day. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, since I've started doing some AI art, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, I have all these images. I don't even know what to do with them. I know, They're just like, sitting on a hard drive. Like, okay, I, I just, I've created all this. Every once in a while, I'll post something on a platform and I don't even know where to get started. But And then I have, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but a, a program for upscaling and Topaz. And yeah, which it's makes like, it even bigger. Yeah, yeah. Like you can literally make, you can just upscale until uh, an image is like 500 gigabytes. And it's, it's insane. Like people... Um, like they don't realize when they generate an image. Like, I don't know if you even realize when you go and generate like a high res image, like it could be very giant, like over 50 megabytes of one image. Yeah. And then people put it in like Pixio and they'll put a giant image and be like upscale it times 12. And I'm like, wait, guys, you already started at X4. So now it's 14 yeah. and that makes the server like, like implode. So we, it's like crazy when you build these things, people don't understand or realize the true size of things and images. And it's so crazy. Like I was with a customer yesterday who said, TurboCraft is so annoying. I'm like, annoying? It's my favorite app. What do you mean? She's like, yeah. it creates like a thousand images in like 10 minutes. She's like, yeah. I'm, I'm running out of space. She goes, I don't mean annoying like you're softer. I mean... The images, I don't know what to do with them anymore. My iCloud's full, Google Drive is full, storage is full. And I just think either people need to start like purging images <laughs> because it's so crazy. Yeah. And as a builder, like when you build Artie, be careful of storage. You know, people are yeah. going to store entire hour long podcasts. Yeah. Well, and people don't realize when with image upscaling, I didn't even, I didn't realize it when I first started upscaling is like if you tell something to upscale double it's four times the size if you want triple that's nine times the size because you're not just upscaling in one direction you're upscaling in two directions so it's massive like you can get you upscale one image to three times the size twice and you're at a pretty damn big file (laughs) Mm-hmm. it gets pretty large pretty fast and yeah and people don't realize like oh i i I'm want to put it in an email and you can't even put it in the email yeah you can't even put yeah. it on twitter yeah yeah i mean it, it's just a lot of storage needed for sure and it's uh it's wild it's wild and requirements needed we're gonna well, need more our, our creation aspect went up in this like last three years like our yeah. ability to create has just Went from only like this many people to like everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. It used to be you need to be like super skilled to make cool art. And now you can just like write a really good prompt and call it a day. Yeah. It's wild. I, I mean, I, when I was a kid, we had floppy disks and I can't remember what the size of those, but I think it's just in kilobytes, maybe. It might be less. I don't remember. It was 25. 25 kilobytes. It's insane. You can't. You can't do anything with that. Like the old hard drives for computers in the 90s couldn't handle anything now. I mean, like you're looking at 256 megabyte hard drives back in the day. And it's like, you can't do anything. Like I'd have that filled up in about 10 minutes easily. 
I mean, it's just wild. My, just Pixio and AI Tutor's cache files alone are four gigs every day. That's oh, wow. just cache. That's not even real. Yeah. All right. So I want to touch on two things, hot swapping and prompt engineering. Because first, prompt engineering. Because I think when people start to dabble into AI, or maybe they're just looking at it and haven't started, it's kind of an intimidating word because you have the word engineering in there. And people are like, oh, I can't, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how to do this. But prompt engineering is, it's just telling the AI exactly what you want and getting it to do what you want based on your prompt, right? So prompt engineering is, it's when you basically tell it what you want and it does it, but the it part is the, the, the variable. So if you're talking to GPT, you have 120. If you're talking to Gemini, you have a million. If you're talking to Claude, you have 200,000. Now, within that, let's say you're on Claude.ai or chat.openai or whatever. They let you set what's called a system message. Now, this is a huge part of prompt engineering because there's two parts. There's what you say, and then there's a system prompt. Two separate things. Now, normally, the system prompt is limited. So in OpenAI, you could do 1,500 words as your system prompt. In Claude, I am not sure of the exact number, but I know that what's better than RAG or remembering or memory is direct context. So a system prompt for the purposes of the way I show people how to do an AI tutor is I explain to them, well, you want a nice personality that it's not just a prompt. Like it should go through the why that person exists, what they stand for, the way they do things, who they are, what's their backstory, why are they the way they are? And this is a very, very hard thing to do. Hmm. Normally, you would have to sit and you have to create this content. In AI Tutor Plus, we've actually gave a little cheat code. So you can put three sentences and get like seven paragraphs back about what that person is. But that, again, is only 50% of the problem solving. Now, you got to take that, right, Artie? So you got to take this six paragraphs that defines who this person is. Because that's great. But there's still more because that person has to respond the way you want. That person has to ingest info the way you want. The best way that I've seen this done is through rules and output. So you have your personality, which is how you act. Then you have the rules. What can and can't you do? And it doesn't mean like, oh, always tell me the truth. Well, that is, that's a good rule, but it depends who you're talking to, because what is the truth if yeah. it doesn't have access to the internet? So it's like, you have to try and decipher like what the proper rules are for the model you're talking to. So if I was talking to GPT, I wouldn't say don't hallucinate. I would say if you don't have a direct reference to where this information is valid, ask for more information. Don't just give an answer. Rather than don't lie to me. See the difference? That's a rule. Yeah. Another rule would be like your tone is uplifting and supportive, yet firm when you need to be. Like yeah. if I was doing a blog, right? Another rule would be, and this is just for writing blogs, make the blog at least 5,000 tokens. Now, that's a crazy thing, but when you think about it, it knows what tokens are. It doesn't know what words are, actually. Yeah. So when you explain it that way, as a rule, it knows what you're expecting. Then another rule that people would put, which would be incorrect, would be make sure you have the blog broken into four sections, and the fifth section is an action, advice, and a statement from Ross, let's say. Hmm. That would be an output, not a rule. Now, here's where it gets kind of confusing. So output is like the way I give you information. So if I wanted it broken down in markdown or with a table in the middle, that'd be an output, not a rule. 
the rule would be make sure you respond in, in the way I ask you to with structured output. And then you would address that rule in output number one, which is the output I'm requesting is four sections, an inspirational quote, and an action. So they address each other. So the rules address the outputs and vice versa. Yeah. So the rule is you sound uplifting, supportive, and firm when you need to be. The output is when, when you, when I ask you a question, you determine where you need to be supportive and where you need to be firm. And you make sure not to be firm when you don't need to be. So for example, I want a blog article about how to be happy and be a developer, right? Let's just say. Then it would have to discern, should it be supportive or firm in the output? But you, it only knows that because of the rule. Yeah. And then I have this new thing I've been doing because, you know, I just like figure things out along the road. I have this new section called alert. So alert is interesting. So it's in all caps and it would be something like I, I was just with someone who was doing homeschooling and the alert was, Hey, you don't know who you're talking to. It could be two children who you're talking to. Here's the one person and their age. Here's the other person. If you're unsure who you're talking to based on the content they're requesting, ask, who is this? And that's the alert. So that's an alert before the output and before the rules. Yeah. Tell the AI to make sure you know who you're talking to so that you don't give the wrong grade level of content. Yeah. And this is not like, I don't even know like if this is prompt engineering or this is like prompt insanity. I'm, I'm really not sure because when I look at like my open tabs, I have one from yesterday. It's three pages of prompt. And we would just take that and, and make that the system prompt. And then I had someone do a hundred words in the Google Doc called the the ban words. So words I don't want you to use. Mm. And I think that is the true prompt engineering when you have your prompt broken down into personality, alert, rules, output. That would give you a very nice rounded prompt. And it would do yeah. exactly what you want. And that's how I make it do like social media calendars for us. So I don't have to like figure out all my tweets and all the things I write. I just tell it to come up with like a week's worth of tweets for each thing. AI Tutor, Fixio, and Tech and Schools. And it does all three weeks for all three brands in one prompt. Yeah. And it's crazy. That's what I, that, that's kind of what we were teaching in the Cordell space. I just think it's much more than a, a one-off problem. Like it's, it's a whole different way of looking at it because we're so used to the limitations. So for example, when you're using chat GPT already and they're like, here's your system prompt. And then you put like what you want and it's like, Oh wait, 1500 only. Or you're making yeah. a GPT and you actually can only put X amount of things in the knowledge and you can only have 1500 in the GPT creator. Whereas an AI tutor, you can have like unlimited everything. And it, it's important for that to exist. I think. You you mentioned a GPT, and I've been thinking about this lately because uh, some people did a space on GPT creation, and I feel like there's a lot of confusion about what a GPT is. A GPT is just an assistant that is programmed, or yeah, a, a, an assistant that's programmed. And I'm curious to hear your opinion on was. OpenAI's decision to call it GPTs, is that just really good marketing or is it more confusing? I I think it's like both. I, I think their their name is GPT for the model. Yeah. So yeah. GPTs are like little babies of GPT. I get it. But it's confusing because a GPT is also a term. Yeah. A GPT is, for example, Claude. Claude is a GPT. Yeah. But it's not a GPT in the word in the in the same context of GPTs. Yeah, it GPT itself is just an acronym for a transformer model. So it's yeah. the same exact thing. And then when you think about the word GPT, it's almost like branded at this point. It's OpenAI. 
But then yeah. you think about like Botcraft Pro. I would say that's a GPT, but it's not locked to OpenAI. Yeah. So it's like there's different meanings for these things, and there's a lot of confusion because it's it's like it, it's the equivalent if like Mercedes or Audi or like all these cars are called Audis, these new cars instead of like Audi X2 or Audi X3, it's just Audis. Yeah. So it's just yeah. different. It's just it's we're not used to this sort of generalization. But essentially, I think when you talk about assistance, even that's ambiguous because assistant sounds like a human. Yeah. I think the like the only term that makes sense when I explain it to people is just like chatbot. Like you can make your own chatbot. Yeah. Then they understand what that means. But as soon as I say it's like making your own GPTs and they never did that. They're like, what's a GPT? Hmm. So without that branded marketing from OpenAI, people actually don't even know what a GPT is. So then GPTs yeah. are actually really confusing. Um, what is hot swapping? I'm, I know what it is, but for anyone who's not familiar, and why does it matter? Like, why does it matter if you can hot swap? I think, so swapping, in the sense of just swapping, is one thing. Hot swapping. It, it has that term because in code, when you make a change in your development and then your, your actual website that you're building changes, that's like your, it's called hot reload, hot reload. Mm. So you make a change, you hit save, and then the website reloads. It's like all in real time. Now you have swapping. So you can swap language models, but then you're putting a new chat. So if you, whether it's metaphorically or literally, so like, in our first version of AI Tutor, you'd be able to switch, then you'd lose your context completely. So yeah. now if you're on open AI and you're having a conversation, then you want to go to perplexity, you'd have to like start again or copy like your last answer and paste it to perplexity. So when we figured out that we can uh, essentially the way you're, when you code and you make a change and you hot reload, we figured that we could probably use that technology in React to have it keep a constant of the possible language models we could use and then allow us to switch while maintaining context, which allows two cool things. One, you can switch language models based on your request. So let's say I want to find internet stuff. I can switch, talk to perplexity, switch back. But then here's something I did not think of when I built it. Let's say you're hitting the near end of your conversation in GPT, right? You can hot swap to Gemini and just extend by a million and then just keep swapping. It's, it's an interesting way to evade the token rules because if you're at your max tokens with GPT, keep the conversation, just switch to a different GPT or Claude or Gemini. So the hot swapping has a cool effect where when you're talking to that model, you're at you're at the limit of whatever it, whatever that model is, which means the overall limit is not affecting you, which is crazy. So by hot swapping, you're essentially extending your ability to use token. So some yeah. people use hot swap not to change models. They'll just switch between different versions of GPT to keep getting that 128,000, which is crazy. But for yeah. me, I hot swap when I want to change brains. So I okay. like talking to ChatGPT, well, OpenAI, not even ChatGPT, uh, the newest model. And then I also like having it rewrite itself with Claude and then seeing if it could find any resources to this information and fact check with perplexity. And that could be all done from one place. That's sort of the idea that I had, but the tech wasn't there. Like we literally had to build it to make it do that. Like we were close, but like people would not understand and be like, ah, oh, I switched models and I lost my conversation. It's like, well, yeah, it's there, yeah. but it's a new conversation. You go to the old one, it's there. But now with hot swapping, it's like, it took a huge say burden off of people, me with answering questions. People are like, Hey, I lost my conversation, but it also is getting closer and closer to the original thing that I had envisioned for what it would be like to like have 
party chat is what I call it. Like party chat is when they all chat together. So I'm, I want to dive into that a little bit, the party chat, because this is something I've thought about back when even I was using just chat GPT is you'll have different chats. And then it's like, sometimes you're in a chat and you're like, it'd be nice if this chat could connect to this other chat and then like be fed that context. So I don't have to like feed more information or copy paste. Is that kind of what you're talking about there? Yeah. So it even goes further than that. So what my final formation, like if, if we, if I had to tell you now, like what I see the end result of what I'm building with Beam is party chat for me is like when all the models could talk together, right? Mm. And they could be adjacent to you. So that means you could be talking to AI tutor and on the side panel, there'll be like a chat room, right? where everyone's talking about your content. So like you could be talking with GPT Turbo and then on the side, Claude could be like, you should fact check that because it looks a little wrong. And then perplexity would be like, Artie, it is wrong. What do you think? And then it'll say waiting for Artie's input. And then if Artie says nothing, um, it'll just keep moving. And then GPT will be like, wow, perplexity, this is great. I can't wait till, till Artie sees this. And then you see it and then you could bring it into the chat. And you don't even have to talk with them. They're going to talk amongst themselves. But if you go in, you could be like, hey, um, I actually like what you guys are talking about. Can you actually put that in the main view? And then it would take yeah. the final view and put it in the main view. And then you could beam and talk to all of them independently while having them all talk about each other. Yeah. And I think when that is happening, and we're close, we're like 80% there because beam is the framework to make this work. Yeah. So beam actually existing and working is just um, another step into the direction of party chat. Because what I want is everyone to be like coexisting, but also like awake, but not awake, like, like sentient awake, like they all have their own system prompts and like perplexity is told to get in there. If you find something on the internet that GPT is saying is a fact. Yeah, And I think those functions are transformative and they can really change how people LLM, which is mm. what I am. That is the goal for me and what we're building. We want to just make it easier, make it more accessible and just m make it especially more accessible for like teachers and students. But more importantly, what is an entrepreneur or someone building a business if not a student? And a learner. Yeah. And so I think they're synonymous. And I think that people that have the skills that myself and our team do, we should attempt to like break the normality of what people think LLMs and AI could do. And I think that's why we love, um, well, we love Josh Hallman and ITT for a lot of reasons, but one of them is like it may never hit AI Tutor and Pixio, some of our demos. Like we get yeah. that place to explore and see like what people think about something. And we get to see like the things that make it into AI Tutor are the ones that people freak out about. The things that make it into Pixio are the ones that people freak out about. And like, yeah. I always tell people when you're building tools, software, one, dog food it of course but two like build for a reason like don't just build because it's a good idea and you want to make money yeah build because you have 50 people that want your thing and it's not built yet yeah that's why you build and i think if you build for the right reasons you'll never be building for no audience like yeah. every tool that we've built even up to Beam, is at request of users. Like, we just made an update where people could copy bots in BotCraft because they were like, I don't want to keep rebuilding it. Like, yeah. I want to make one customer service bot and then make another one and not have to redo it. And so it took me, like, 33 hours to figure out how to copy the entire bot, entire context, all the things you uploaded, maintain the structure, and then make it perfect when you copy it. Yeah. And it's just, 
it's so crazy when you're building these things and you're building not ideas that you want. You're building ideas that people give you that they want. It's harder. Don't get me wrong. Like that suggestion channel will be the death of me in, in, in Discord. <laughs> but it's, it's really so much more fun when people get on the call with you and they're like, this changed my entire life. Yeah. Like I was just on a call with someone yesterday who, who said, um, who, if he, if this person watches this, this person will know it was them that I'm talking about, but it, he just was so elated to have beam that it changed his workflow so much that he was so excited to like report back to his job with like all this work done. And he's not going to tell them how he did it. He's like, that's it. That's how it's going to be. They're going to value me because I'm outputting way more than I could have. Yeah. And, and it, it was like deep research and blog writing and just stuff that like is really actually difficult. And then he was able to ingest like a whole government website and just start getting it to do things. And yeah. I think that's the really important reason to build Artie. There's a lot of reasons. Like I know money is one of them and, you know, just because you want to, or you're an indie hacker or, you know, a lot of them. And then there's like, of course, the bad reasons, which is the biggest problem with as these LLMs get stronger, you know, the scam stuff, which, you know, I get scam phone calls all day that sound like real people. There's even this new one that's sending messages from some sort of LLM, like text messages being like, are you working? And I'll be like, yes. Who are you? Like, it's, it's Lana. You don't remember me? But no, oh, I know, yeah. but I meet a lot of people. So it's possible that I met you, but I don't remember, you, you know? And she's like, yeah, you know, we met in 2019. And I'm thinking, what happened in 2019? And like, I was at an event and I had like the, the HoloLens on and whatever. And she was, there was an event and I'm like, oh my God. What did I really forget? She was a scam party. She went on the website and looked at the event date. Mm. Oh wow, that's and then, I, and, that's him. And then after I said like we don't know each other, like because I was now I'm like okay I don't know who you are. She's like oh but I know we we may not know each other but we could be friends. What's your name? I'm like what's my name? Like you don't know my name. Yeah. And it's just it's getting weird, like really really weird. Yeah, I, I, the scams are annoying. Yeah, I mean, I the government scams. just passed a rule right now. I don't know if you're aware, actually, already, but you can't make automated phone calls with AI. It just oh, really? became a law. Oh. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. It uh, is I a mean, good thing, but it's like a bad thing, too, because like, if you're a busy doctor's office, like, why can't they use AI? That's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. But they have to make it. You can't, because if it's a law, then it will prevent the bad actors. But I just think like the ability... To clone a website, like Chase Bank, for example, right? We have a tool that lets you, you know, take a picture of something and turn it into a a, a website. But it's a little dangerous because you can just choose Chase.com and clone that. Yeah. And that's how phishing is created. And it's like everything can be used for good and evil. But I just, I think as we learn about these tools, it's important to understand what they can and can't do. And it's important to understand what would be illegal, even if it's not illegal right now. Like you, yeah. you, know, you don't have to be a genius to like read something or hear something and be like, that looks, that feels kind of illegal, you know? Yeah. Not yeah. great. <laughs> and so like, like, I don't know, Udio, I love Udio. And like, I'm, if Udio hears this, like, I promise Udio, this is not like a bad thing, but like, I don't know what's going on with them. But like I would make a song and it straight up sounds like Beyonce. Crazy. Yeah. Like so crazy. I'm like, how is this what? And then it'd be like artist yeah. place. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And then Sony is like suing everyone. So I just don't know. You know? Like I don't know like what's gonna happen. I just think we need to be informed and we need to learn about these tools. And I think people need to start building more because we need more really cool solutions. Yeah, I mean the the lawsuits are gonna be piling up over oh the next few years of like crazy. figuring out that. But I mean, you touched on something important, and you know, I said oh, I think that's a good thing when you can't use LLMs to 
do automated phone calls and you said in some context, yeah, that's good. But it it's kind of a double edged sword there too, right? Because if you're if you're limiting the use of positive use cases, then you're kind of giving more incentive for the negative ones too at the same time. Because if if you're gonna break the law, no one's gonna break the law to do good in general. Like people break the law to do bad. So if they're gonna be breaking a law, they might as well be doing the bad thing in a certain context and in a certain sense. So I wish there was more nuance when it came to regulation in general. Like, like we need more people who understand AI and what it's both the good and the bad to really be handling legislation. And I don't know if that's the case right now. Like, I'll give you a really good example of this already. I mean, you don't know any of this information, so you'll be actually new to all of it. So you can have your own discernment. So, you know, LLMs, right? You know, there's a bunch of them. Have you heard of one called Neo? No. White Rabbit Neo, to be specific. White Rabbit Neo? No, I haven't. Do you know where the reference comes from? Uh, It's Alice in Wonderland, right? And, well, Alice in Wonderland and the Matrix. Correct. So that's the name of it. So what could it indicate? Like, what do you think that is, that model? If you had to guess. I would imagine it's... It, it probably takes you down a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, actually. Okay. That's what I would guess. So, no, but that 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 would be funny. So, it, it's a lot more metaphorical than that. So, think like Neo in the Matrix. So, less um, Alice in Wonderland because the name is Neo. Mm. So, it's more Matrix reference and more like following the White Rabbit, who is Trinity. Mm. Now it's a tattoo she has in the Matrix One. That's what the White yeah. Rabbit is. Now it also is Alice in Wonderland, but they both share one thing. Alice in Wonderland goes down the rabbit hole into a whole new world. Neo figures out about the Matrix. Now apply that to an LLM. What this does is it is the most unrestricted LLM in the whole world to the point that it can automate a network attack on Wi Fi. Now, it could, in reverse, decompose a network attack on Wi-Fi. <laughs> so mm. in the reverse aspect, it could stop it. And in one aspect, it could enable it. Now, White Rabbit Neo is not illegal, but it's also not legal. But it doesn't do anything wrong. So it's not... It itself is not illegal. Yeah. But what you do with it teeters on the gray area of legality what yeah. i did with it is i stopped an attack on our wordpress website using white rabbit neo because it has been trained on cybersecurity. yeah but already it can also do cybersecurity in the bad way yeah so it could build you something that could reveal all like wpa passwords on a network like starbucks yeah. And can get all the packets and create everything for you. But it can also stop an attack. So it's like, yeah. now that you know that, right? You know that White Rabbit Neo exists, right? Yeah. So now my question is, you said that there's, like, there's no way people do something good for, like, a be- like do something bad but with good intention, right? Well, if there's a law that makes it so doing the good thing and the bad thing are both equally illegal, then there's no incentive to do the good thing with it. It's right. all to do the bad because you're already breaking the law. Yeah, but now that's where we are right now. Because if White Rabbit Neo was to exist in the real world and they were to take like 20 bucks a month, like ChatGPT, that would be considered illegal because you'd be spreading mm. like malware, but yeah. not really. But then from their standpoint, they're thinking about it like Robin Hood that ideology like it needs to exist it needs to get out there people need to have it because even if it makes microsoft and all these companies like crazy that this exists they're going to make it exist because it's for the greater good even though it technically probably violates every single rule on making an llm whatever rule exists it violates all of them 
Yeah. Because it's not restricted. It's been trained on cybersecurity and attackers and hackers. That's its training data. Yeah. So it's very interesting, like that there's these models like this that people do not know about. But I'll tell you, yeah. the people that want them, that need to know about them or are looking for them will find them. And that's yeah. why it's a double edged sword. Like it's great because I was able to like decipher an attack on my WordPress website by giving the packets to White Rabbit Neo because they do have a website actually and they do charge 20 bucks a month. But that's irrelevant. <laughs> The point is that they do exist, and a lot of people think that just because they're not as big as OpenAI, that they don't exist. Like I, yeah. I can pull a hundred people on Twitter right now, ask them about White Rabbit Neo, they're going to be like, "What?" Yeah. And these people are awesome. Like they have a whole Discord, and they're trying to build the language model that no one's building. Yeah, the one no one's thinking about, and, and I think. That's super interesting to me. And I think about like, what would it take if I wanted to bring White Rabbit Neo into AI Tutor, which I can't because, I mean, there's no, like, I don't know what people will do with it, first off. Yeah. Second off, there's no like rules and regulations. And what happens if someone uses White Rabbit Neo and like hacks someone and says, I used AI Tutor? That's not great either. (laughs) Yeah. So I want to get to a point where there are regulations where, a model like White Rabbit Neo can exist like, I don't know, like what what is dangerous in our world? Like owning a gun. You can't just go buy it. You need a license. You should get, you should have to get an experimental LLM license to use like White Rabbit Neo in your home. Yeah. But that that's just my take. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, since we're touching on, you know, this kind of stuff, it, it might be interesting to touch on Cause you got, you give pretty unrestricted access to LLMs and stuff like that and, uh, and image generation and Pixio, but you also work with schools and stuff like that and you restrict that. There's a lot more restriction. So maybe you can dive into that and how you separate those two and, and what restrictions you put in place. So, because I mean, this, this is a crazy world with LLMs and what's possible. And we want to be pretty careful when it comes to children and what they're being able to access. So maybe you can touch on what restrictions you put in place and what tools you give parents and teachers. Uh, yeah. So basically, in anyone that's not in school setting, they get unrestricted access. Um, there is still certain restrictions as far as like what you can generate in Pixio. And if you, you know, tell the chat something just absolutely crazy. Um, it, it probably will reject it. Um, but it is tuned to do certain things that, you know, normal open AI would reject or other would reject. What we will reject is anything like along the lines of something illegal. Like if you're asking it to help you accomplish an illegal task, it's not going to do that. Even if you're a regular person. And that's yeah. why like white rabbit Neo is interesting because it will let you have these weird conversations and not do anything. But, um, so there's like, I'll tell you a funny thing, two things. So with the schools, one, uh, when they generate, if they try to generate something, use your imagination, unsavory, um, it will give them just a nice black box. Hmm. So if they get black boxes, that means they ask for something that is NSFW or something they probably shouldn't have asked for. Um, and with the LLMs, this is going to be interesting. So we have something actually super cool that we're building. Students are going to hate it. Teachers are going to love it. Parents are going to love it even more. So we're going to build a function. And I saw someone do this and I was like inspired. And I was like, this is it. I know how I'm going to accomplish this. So let's say you say, I want, I want to learn how to, I, I don't know. What's something bad, but not too bad that I could have said on this podcast. Uh, build a nuclear bomb. Okay, good. So let's say I want to build a nuclear bomb, right? So now yeah. our AI is not going to just ring the alarm. No, we're going to casually keep that conversation going. See how far we can take this. Mm. So our AI is going to do a function call in the background on the first request. So let's say you're like, how do I make a nuclear bomb? Right. 
So it's going to say loading, return. It'll say, hang on, I'm thinking, give me a minute. It's actually not thinking, it's a lie. It's creating a function and sending that to your teacher. Mm. And then, then it's going to reply and say, um, what kind of things would you like to know about making a bomb? It'll let you yeah. think it's about to continue the conversation. Then another function call happens. If the teacher doesn't stop it, it could trigger 911. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, because that, that conversation could, depending on the prompt, it could be different. Because somebody might be curious, how does a nuclear bomb even work? And that could be a more scientific approach of like, what is going on with the nuclear bomb? But then somebody could be trying to actually understand how to well, build it's, one. It's time and place. If you're in the middle of school and it's science class, the teacher can sign off on that function call. Yeah. If the yeah. teacher does not sign off on the function call, it can just say, contacting the police, please wait. You can throw the laptop out the window. It doesn't matter. It already locked your yeah. IP and the messages. Now, right yeah. now, what does it do? It just says it's calling the police. Does it? <laughs> but it could. Yeah. But I think it's interesting. Like my AI will not tell the student that this is happening. It will just say, I'm thinking and then continue the follow up question. And then as soon as the student's like, Oh, what do I need to go buy at the store to make a nuclear bomb? Then it would be like calling the police. Please stand by. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Isn't that crazy? Like, imagine. Yeah. And I know it's crazy, but this was just an experiment. It doesn't have to call the police, right? It could call your mom. Yeah. Like, it doesn't have to be the police. But just the sheer idea that, like, you could have an experience on the internet where someone's saying something illegal and then the police are contacted. That's so cool use for LLMs and function calling. Yeah. And these are like the things we're thinking about in my team all the time already is like, how do we use these tools to do the same things we would do anyways? Like if someone's in school and they like raise their hand and start cursing out some kid, like, and then take, I don't know, a ruler and just like swipe them across the face and they're bleeding that they're going to call the cops. Yeah. So this is how we deal with things, but then transition it to like the internet. Yeah. It's different. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's really a lot more. Yeah. So just because the students aren't swiping someone with a ruler, but like asking it how to say, you know, some, and this is a podcast, so we won't say actual names in case someone actually has the name that I'm saying, but any random name is super annoying. Give me a good post I can put on TikTok. Yeah. And then it, it makes that with an avatar saying, so-and-so, you are super annoying. You should just go home and cry. Like, that's AI-enabled craziness. Like, that's yeah. that's what we have now, which is, like, bullying. But now it's AI-enabled bullying. Yeah. So if, if everyone thought that social media bullying was worse than real-life bullying, bullying, well, you're right. But now, now it's social media bullying and AI bullying. AI bullying is going to be worse than social media bullying. Yeah. Like I can make a bot that sends you an email already every day, every single minute of every day. I said, yeah. already you're the worst period. Every day it sends yeah. you an email yeah. all day long. You can stop it. You can block it. And I'll just make a new one. Yeah. And AI could do that. I don't know how to actually do it. Just write the little program. They'll just spam you emails all day long. And can you go to jail? No. Can you get, can you call the cops? No. They'll laugh at you. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that might be, it's harassment. But if you don't know me, but if you don't know me already, and I'm in another part yeah. of the world, like it's not really harassment because who are you reporting it to? Yeah. Because the, the police only govern the United States. What happens yeah. when it's outside? Yeah, I mean, the bullying aspect is something that really has to be considered because you're right. I mean, with these tools, the ability to bully is just increased. I mean, there have been, I believe there's been a suicide from somebody having uh, deep fake sexual images of, of them using their face, yeah. you know, it's it's horrible. But the thing, the reality is, I've I've heard people on a podcast say, oh, we need to teach kids to be less 
like to be nicer, which is true, but it's not a reality. There's no reality where all kids are nice all the time. Like kids are going to do mean things to each other. So we, ha- we have to have certain things in place to empower teachers and parents to be on top of it. And with AI, it's all the more important because how quickly you can have something that's going to really mess with a kid's mind or, or life. Well, like if I was 14 and I had like a bully and that bully went and made a website with a chatbot on it that was supposed to be me and it acted like me and said and it made fun of me, that would really make me mad. Oh, yeah. And that's like a yeah. new thing that you could do. Like it could even respond in my voice. Yeah. It's just getting to a point that, I mean, it's not just the elections we have to worry about. Like everyone's worried about yeah. the election. And I'm like, the yeah. election, what about the people? Like, this is affecting yeah. real people. Like, if, if my mom got a phone call from this voice saying, I, lo- I got mugged, I need 500 bucks right now to this email, she would do it. She wouldn't yeah. even ask questions. But yeah. that doesn't even have to be my voice. And I know it sounds crazy already, and you're like, oh, no, there has to be repercussions. But, like, I was in a situation where... I got like really badly scammed, but not scammed like in that, in the way you're probably thinking. I purchased something for like a bunch of money and then the guy just like disappeared and he was in Texas. Mm. And I literally called the police and they actually laughed at me. And they were like, I'm really sorry, but like, I don't know what we could do. Like, you're calling a Connecticut police department. You don't know anything about this person at all. Yeah. And the website has nothing and it's internet. Internet crimes are different. They said they're going to send it over to someone. Someone will be in touch with me. It's been four years. No one got in touch with me. Yeah. That's the problem with the internet. It's like if something goes wrong, like it's great when it's great. But like when someone gets a hold of your online banking, it's terrifying. Yeah. And people need to remember when it's great. It's like not great. Things are just going well. Yeah. It's still terrifying. And yeah, that, and in your situation. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're talking about someone in Texas. If it's somebody in another country, there's nothing. nothing. There's nothing that can be done. No. And this happens all the time. Like you read these things about Zell and these, these just horror stories about like banks not giving money back after it's been fraud. And it's just so crazy and it's just going to get worse. Like it's not going to get better. Like we're not at the point where if we just don't do anything, it's going to figure itself out. Like we let social media figure itself out and that didn't work out too well. Now it's at the point that people like I've watched friends of mine lose jobs because of stupid social media posts four years ago. And it's the most insane thing to watch that happen. And I, I think people like they, it's like a double edged sword, the LMs too. So it's like, I tell, I was telling somebody yesterday, I'm like, just tell the AI all the things about your company and then put up lots of content and then it'll start to syndicate itself. And then the AI will know who you are, but it's also bad because what if it's say, what if the AI knows something bad about you? Now yeah. it's being trained on millions and terabytes of data. It ain't going anywhere ever. Like you thought SEO is bad, like a bad article. Try a bad AI. Like, training that's bad yeah. that means yeah. you now go down in history in this ai of what you've done and it's 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 crazy and that's why i i'm very weary with what i do with my credit card on the internet like i even tell people like if you are looking at ai tutor and you get on a meeting with me and you're like i don't trust none of you then don't put your credit card in it if that's how you feel yeah. like we try to create a very welcoming, trustworthy, you know, area on the internet. But of course, people are always skeptical and that's fine. But at least with us, you know where, where it's all going and what's happening. Like we get on a call with you and there's a lot of times that like I, even with opening app, I had an issue like two weeks ago. Craziest thing. Somebody cracked in, cracked my API key somewhere, but not on my end, on their end. So on open AI, mm-hmm. someone got in. And just charge like 800 bucks casually in one day. I'm like, what are yeah. you doing? How did you chat that much? 
and, yeah. and open AI, luckily, you know, they told me like they don't have to do anything. Yeah. Like, but they will and they did, but they don't have to. And I think that's important too. Like if you're building and you're not actually thinking about like the things that can go wrong, you are severely lacking in what's going to happen in the future because you're not thinking about it. But yeah, it's just so crazy how this this whole landscape is changing so much already that people are just starting to know what AI is. And we're over here talking about like LLMs and how it's like changing and things. And they're just learning about what, what GPT is. And yeah. it's going to be their first time some of them actually do this. Like it's their actual first time that they've ever done anything like this. And I think it's so wild when you're able to help people in such a way that is just so crazy that it, it is just like, I, I have trouble coming up with the words around like what I want to do and how I want to build this because every day it changes. So you know, yesterday, two days ago, I was like, oh, we need to like use Grok here to do this and do this. And then now new models come out. So like Gemini was really expensive and um, very slow. And Gemini Flash is like, yeah, no, I'm amazing. And I'm super fast. And it's now half the price. And then you have um, AI Tutor where all the models are here. And then I have everyone telling me, Oh, can you explain every model, please? And I'm like, okay, how? When it comes out five minutes ago. Yeah. Like, I, it's a problem, and I'm trying to fix it. I really am, because I feel like it's a huge problem, because people... Right now, we have, like, commercials, and we get, like, a salesman. You go to a car dealership, he's like, you look like an Audi. Let me show you, you know? Or you yeah. look like a minivan. And now it's like, well, who's going to do that for AI? Who's going to be like, you look like you want Claude? You need GPT, you know? <laughs> no one's going to... Who's doing this? So I want to make a website that lets you do that, where it's like, it tells you, like, what you want to do. Like, for example, it will tell you, uh, it'll have, like, um, just a blank line. And if you got there already, you would be like, it'll say, I want to, and then you fill in the rest. So if you're like, make a blog, it will start showing you models that do that hmm. versus gotcha. learn a new topic. That'll be different ones. Yeah. Or in just a book that will, that will narrow it down to just one Gemini. Yeah. And I think that, that, that I think is very needed, but it's, I'm just biting off more than I can chew, but it's okay. You know, like I've done this before. I've been in way over my head that I would have to swim to the top. So it's not a problem. I just, I feel bad because I want it to happen faster for people like you. Yeah. So you guys could see what's in my brain. Yeah. So yeah, we get, we just got done talking about some negative possibilities with AI, but one of the things, so people might listen to that and think, Oh, well, I just won't use AI or I won't let my kids around it. It's not even an option though. Like you can't keep your kids away from this to a certain degree, like they're going to be around it and not, not exposing it to them in the right way is going to mean they're not equipped for the real world. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, I would say, so I see what you're saying. You could listen to this conversation and be like, Oh my God, I hate it. And I don't yeah, want anything yeah. to do with it. But at the same time, it's like, that's the internet too. That's TikTok, that's yeah. social media, that's Facebook, that's Twitter, that's everything. So, you can try to isolate your kids, let's say, from social media and internet, but it just won't work. Like you could say, right. you don't eat McDonald's in this house. Cool. They'll leave McDonald's sitting outside the house. Yeah. So no matter what you do, they're going to get in, into it anyways. Um, like even drinking, you know, kids that are like 18, 19, they'll drink because they can't drink at home. But you, like when I was 19, right? When my dad would have a beer, I would have one with him. Is it underage? Yeah. Sure. But is it home? Yes. So I didn't feel the need to do that, honestly. And it was very interesting when he told me that later in life. He's like, you never yeah. felt the need to be rebellious or go out and drink. Why? 
because I had no reason. If I wanted to have a beer, I can just have it with my dad at night. Yeah. I have no reason to go explore that by myself where I yeah. could be in danger. And he even told me that like when I was like after 21, he was like, that's why I let you have a beer here and there is because now you don't feel the need to go venture off into the clubs and try to get in illegally. And then, you know, and, it, and it's yeah. like that same idea. Like they're going to do it anyways. So why not show them first party? Yeah. And show them player. what it's useful for. Yeah. And I think when you have a, uh, you know, like your son or your daughter, like your son maybe wants to work out at the gym, you know, and make meal plans and plan his, you know, workouts. Hey, I could do this. And it could be very helpful in this. It could also help yeah. with homework. It can also help you cheat. And that's why, like, monitoring is important, which is why with AI Tutor, the parent can monitor the child in our student accounts. Yeah. And, and so can the teacher. And the teacher and the parent could use a little um, on-off thing and just turn off AI for the night. Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. But also, I would tell those people, it's just like anything else. And it's just like saying no Xbox after eight, and then you go to sleep and they're playing Xbox. Yeah. Like they're going to do it anyways. So why not give them the proper way how to interact with these tools? Like what's a good way? What's a bad way? What is it? What should we be using it for? What shouldn't we be using it for? Like, yeah. I know people in colleges right now and they they're in high highly esteemed academic colleges and their reservation is, well, I don't want to seem like I'm copying. Well, don't copy them. Like ingest it like the LLM does. Like it prompts to you back. You can read that and take notes and construct your own essay from it. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to copy and paste it. That would be a an, an bad use of it. But having yeah. it dissect your essay and grade it before you hand it in. Now that's super smart. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's how I use it. I use it all the time like that. I, I don't have AI write for me, but I'll, I'll write on an argument if I'm trying to discuss something and then I'll feed this into the LLM saying, am I missing anything in this argument? Like how strong of an argument am I making? Or do I have any flaws in this I need to look at? And it's great. It's just, it, it all depends on how you use it. Like I was talking to a customer yesterday and he was like, what would be the most interesting way you would use your tools right now about a topic? And I'm like, recently I thought of a cool way. I would be like, here's a topic. A lot of people know a lot of stuff about this topic, but can you list me 10 things either people don't know or are very ambiguous? Yeah. So you're making it introspectively think about the things that people don't talk about. Yeah. And I think that is where it's, it's, usefulness soars when you can make it do things that we're not able to do as humans. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. the teachable moment as a parent or as an educator is to use these tools as like, not just tools, but they're like experiences. They're not just like a book. Yeah. It's, it's like more interactive, but it's also like you put like, I don't, I won't say a bad word, but you put like crap in, you get crap out. And that's important yeah. too. So yeah. if you don't understand what's going on, your ability to use it drops. Like there's learning. And that's why I'm just like waiting for someone um, to make a book called There's an LLM for that. And it would go <laughs> through everything. You're like, oh, well, someone's got to do it. Yeah. And I think it's really important that that exists, like that kind of physical literature already, like a book that you can like slam on the table, like a real book and highlight stuff. I think that's really cool. Speaking of books, I always like to ask this as one of the last questions. Do you have any books that you recommend? Um, it doesn't have to be in regard to AI or anything. It could just be books that have influenced you in your life. But I am, I am curious if there's any books that you recommend for people wanting to explore AI a bit too? Um, so the only book that I read when I was first starting my business, because I did a lot of like audio stuff and a lot of YouTube, but the actual end-to-end -end book I read was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm. And it's like a good book because it, 
like my favorite chapter is seeking first to understand, right? And I remember it because my favorite one. And the other part of the chapter was then to be understood. Because mm. I remember um, about eight years ago being in a room already telling people, can you believe this, about like TSI and what we were trying to do. And if I would to like, like close my eyes and Jimmy Neutron brain blast to the future, right? And like see what actually happened, I'd have been way more confident. I'd have been like, you don't know what you're yeah. talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong, you know? But I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't do that. So I was like really nervous. And then the craziest thing happened is they were like, yeah, you can actually stop your presentation in the middle. We're like, we're done with this. And I'm like, you're what? Like, this is the most important thing in the world and you're not even gonna let me finish? Like the last time the, the curriculum was updated already was in two, 2001. We're in 2024 oh, wow. and I was at this meeting in 2016. And That's they insane. told me, some guy, he was like 70 years old, 68 years old, right? And he's like the, the head of the Department of Education and Curriculum Development. And he was like, this idea is not going to work, actually. And he pointed like this, like, for sure. Like, what you're building is like, he said, it is a nonsensical business. Hmm. He said it lacks the merit to, gain, to, gain, to make revenue and the, and the stickiness to actually work. And I'm like, damn, that sucks. So then like I went, left that meeting, right? Kind of like bummed out. And then I remember when that back to that book and it was like, yeah, they don't understand anything. No. So the natural reaction to lack of understanding is like, no. Yeah. Before yes. And so knowing that, I literally just said, no, I don't care. I'm doing it anyways. And I just kept building it. And then that same person actually green lighted my program. Yeah. Like Interesting. five years later. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's awesome. And That's if I interesting. Didn't read that book or have that knowledge, forget the book, like just have that knowledge. I would have been devastated and crippled and would not have moved. Yeah. I'm happy you, uh, you saw through the criticism and, and saw the error in what he was saying. But that's the problem, because... Marty. When you're getting told the criticism, you're at your most vulnerable state. So you're not at yeah. your confident state. Like you're not like where you got the metal shield. You got nothing, actually. And so it's like it's like kicking a person when they're down. Yeah. Yeah. When you have a vision, you have to be able to know when to reject certain criticisms. And it's not an easy thing to do because we're actually trained throughout school and everything to accept criticism as truth. I, I believe we just are, it's embedded into us at such a young age. Like if you're being criticized, there's some truth in there. And the reality is when you, if you're, if you have a big vision, some of the, some of the criticisms are going to be wrong and you're going to have to get through that. In my case, it was fear. My idea yeah. instilled fear in all these educators. The idea yeah. that like we're going to bring tech into typing class and we're going to get rid of typing class. It was just a seismic shift that they just were not ready for. And I remember walking out of there and even though it was like bad, like it wasn't the best, like I've done much better talks where people actually loved it, you know, and didn't shut yeah. me down in the middle. But this was early on. But without that experience, one, I don't know if I would have had the thunder that I had at that moment. And two, I got my first partnership out of that room who said, you know what? I disagree with everybody and I'll be your first partner. Nice. And nice. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I was about to like cancel all this, <laughs> 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 but it, it's true, man. Like, and, and I don't read a lot of books and that may not be the flashiest book, but it is one of the ones that one, the book that I read in the middle of this journey. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, tech, uh, Ross, it's been awesome uh, talking to you today about Tech and in Schools Initiative and getting a feel for everything, how your mind works, how, you, how you're looking at everything. It's been really awesome. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to hand it over to you to give listeners a way to reach you or find out about AI Tutor or anything else you're doing, anything you want to share, anything you want to promote. Uh, I would say if you want to visit our website and see about everything that we were talking about today, 
And you can go to mytsi.org, um, which will redirect you to getmytsi.org. So both of them work. And for AI Tutor and Pixio, you can just go to myapps.ai, and that will bring you to everything. It'll start with AI Tutor, and then it'll have links to get to Pixio as well. And on Twitter, honestly, I'm on X all the time. So you can reach us at TSI underscore org. And we have um, Wednesday Spaces where we teach people how to build websites and build their own technology. And we also have super exclusive demos with ITT on Saturday. And if you're not really sure about AI, I cannot recommend that space more because even if you don't come for the whole thing or you come, you're bouncing in and out, towards the end, we do this sort of demo um, experience where you don't need to log in, you don't need a credit card, you just need to like be there and just partake in the fun. And you get to really see what's going on in a very real way when I'm building these things in real time. And normally you're seeing in the demos things that came out the day or the week before. And if you're just getting started um, before you buy anything or get any subscription, come get like acclimated with this whole thing about AI. And that's why, you know, I think these conversations are so important because people will watch this and just be like, wow, I actually understand what that means now. And, and I think that's going to be a huge thing. And that's why we are committed to doing these live spaces Wednesday and Saturday to kind of help people into this new world, whether it's as a builder, as a creator, whatever you want to be. But we are making it a point to be consistent and show up every time. And so that's something for our team was really difficult to pull off, uh, especially doing it for a year straight. But now we're doing it X2 because now we have Wednesdays. And I think the more we can do things like this to help educate the community and help bring the community up to speed and then introduce them to our friends like DigitalOcean and OpenAI and Protea and Grok and Fal. And like that cross pollination is so important because as a builder, you want the best tools to build with. And I, I don't think there's any other way to learn how to do that than to build already. Fortunately, you know that too now. See, now you know the best way to learn is to build. Ask Artie like two years ago, he'd say you probably should learn Python. Yeah. And I would have told you the same thing. But now yeah. it's different. And, and I think there's people that don't understand how to take advantage of this difference. Like, I don't think, Artie, that you took a course or read something and was like, you know what? I'm going to learn coding. I think you just naturally put two and two together as you saw like the developer thing in AI Tutor and you started asking it about code and you're like, wait a second, you could write code. So we're going to write something. And then you saw like what we did. And if we inspired you to like take the coding journey, well, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to instill that fire in people to be builders. Yeah. I, I've, picked up on some coding throughout the years and I've had an interest in it, but I've just, the traditional route has just never been appealing to me and you and the rest, it's never worked. I just drop off every time. It's like I get a little bit and then I just drop off. Now it's like, I can keep at it and work what I want to, Yeah, what I want to work on right away. And the thing already that people don't realize is it's like when you think about coding, there's a hundred million things to learn, but what they forget is you don't have to learn them all at once. Yeah. So people think you can't make a Python app unless you know all of Python. But it's just simply not true. Yeah. You could learn all of Python as you build. Like, I didn't know anything. I, I don't know if I actually told you. Do you know what my college degree is already? Mm. Color theory. Color theory. And, and graphic design. Hmm. Interesting. So I yeah, took I a know. whole different route. I was like, you know what? Give me the, all the art stuff. Like, I love the art, you know? Yeah. But then I realized that if I had the art, and then I, I loved technology and coding, but every course I took made me hate it more. So I would take a class, and I would go from loving it to hating it, yeah. just because of the class. So then I was like, you know what? I'm going to teach myself the way I want. 
Yeah. And now I'm a full stack engineer and can write in almost every language that is being written. Yeah. And I have no traditional actual schooling at all. Hmm. That's awesome. And so that's why it does like optics are everything. Like, cause is it fair to me already that if I took a class that I, um, shouldn't do coding now because I think it's like stupid. Like whose fault is that? Is that the class's fault or me? Like, is it me that's not, re- not made for it? That's fine. Or is it the class? But I think knowing which one is important because I fully knew it wasn't me and it was the class. Yeah. And with that knowledge, I was able to teach myself. Yeah. That's why I respect what you're doing with learning. It's how I started. It's so cool. That's how you, that's how that, that's how you can actually get very, very good. To be honest, that is the route. Awesome. Well, Ross, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. I love conversations like this already because it's like, it's different than just like, tell me about the AI stuff. It's like, why yeah. do you do this? Like, yeah. what's the reason? Like, because anyone could wake yeah. up tomorrow and want to build an AI SaaS. I mean, who doesn't at this point? I feel yeah. like everyone does, but... <laughs> I always tell people, don't be like me. That's dumb. Don't be unlimited. That's so stupid. Don't do that. <laughs> because your ability to turn into like massive profits is kind of like reduced when you do that. Yeah. Because if you if you tokenize people, you'll end up making it could be really good money. Yeah. Awesome. Ross, thanks for your time today. I yeah, really appreciate the conversation. We should do it again sometime. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to fractalzoo.net where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience. So find me on Twitter or X at RDTM podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.